Just curious, did you get a chance to check out my last video? The one about spring in Vancouver? If not, you should check it out. Hey, squirrel. All right, if you had any questions about my attention span, that's about it. I have none, and a squirrel just got me. That was it. Yeah, emails. All right, welcome back, everybody. My name is Ben Schubert. I am a filmmaker, and if you didn't see my last video about spring in Vancouver, I highly recommend checking it out. You want to take a second and go check it out? No. You either watched it already or you can see it after. Link in the description. You're not getting away from here. That's crazy. Why do they have those like weird info cards where it's like, if you want to see this other video, go check it out and leave the one I'm talking about. Uh, I feel like that just promotes a bad behavior of, what's it called? ADD? Low attention spans? Just killing your attention spans. So if you've been following this channel for a while, you know that I picked up the Canon ESR a few months ago. I've talked about it a lot, so I'm not really going to go into why I picked up that camera. But one of the main reasons I got it was because of how well it would match for the C200 and C300 for when I have to rent those for bigger projects. And I've been coveting the C200 for probably about a year now. My original plan was to start with the EOS R, uh, work with that for a while, and then, you know, if demand for a C200 uh, really made sense, then I would go that route. But it really hasn't at this point. And so I picked up the Atomos Ninja 5, or Ninja V, I'm not sure how you're supposed to be saying that. Um, I should probably check Atomos, but I frankly don't care. So the point is, I picked up the Ninja Recorder because of its ability to record 4K 10-bit. So when I got the Ninja 5, I thought it would up my capabilities a little. I did not really know what to expect, and I really, from what I had seen online, I hadn't seen anything that really amazing out of this, so I wanted to take some time and do some tests and put it through its paces. So I really wanted to see what I could pull off, uh, shooting available light with this camera and recorder set up, and frankly, I was pretty impressed, right? And if we look at the grades, we can see how much you can actually pull this footage without it falling apart. And one thing that I found really impressive is that when I first started shooting with this camera, I noticed that there's a, quite a bit of banding in the skies. Okay, anytime you have a blue sky, you've got a gradient of blue, right? It's not just a solid color. It goes from a light blue to a dark blue. And what you typically see with 8-bit footage is banding across the sky. This was shot when I first got the camera, and you can see bands in the sky above me. And what you notice with this other footage is not only is there no banding, but I've actually pushed the color quite a bit further. And that's all a result of shooting in 10-bit, right? So shooting in 8-bit, so 8-bit video for people who aren't familiar with that. So 8-bit will give you about hundreds of thousands of colors. I'm not going to be specific on this. Maybe there'll be a number that shows up later. Uh, but 10-bit gives you millions of colors. And basically what that gives you is more information in the color range so that you have a smoother roll-off for your images, right? And so as a result, you're not gonna get banding, you can push colors further, and it actually reduces the color noise considerably. Another benefit of shooting with this system is that the footage that I get is actually in QuickTime files as opposed to MP4 files. And my computer is by no means a fast machine, right? But it still handled the 4K 10-bit uh, QuickTime files pretty well, especially with grading and with uh, stabilization all over it. Anyways, my point is, I've said this before, but you should always be editing in QuickTime when you're working on a Mac. It just makes everything faster and smoother, and if you can record in QuickTime, that's even better. And that's one of the benefits of using the Atomos Ninja, is that it goes straight to QuickTime, it makes my life a lot more simple and easy, and the colors I get out of it are that much better. Uh, will I do any vlogging with this setup? Probably not. It's pretty, it's pretty big and unwieldy. But for my work setup, where I'm behind the camera and I'm running this machine, 
I would absolutely keep this setup because it's so much better than what I was doing before. So all the footage from the previous video was shot in ProRes 422. Uh, what I'm, my face here right now, this talking head piece of nonsense, that's being shot in ProRes 422 LT. I think that's what it's called. I'll correct it if it's not. If I'm wrong, if I'm wrong. But what I found is that the level of detail and clarity is pretty impressive. And the sharpness is really gonna only come down to what your lenses are. So the main question I had before the setup was, could this fit in a workflow with a C200 or a C300? And kind of where would that be, right? So I would definitely say that the footage out of this looks better than the C200 MP4 image, right? It's way richer, it's way clearer. I've done tests looking between the two and the footage on the EOS R looks a lot better. There's definitely limitations as to what the EOS R can do. For instance, it can't do, you know, the 120 at uh, 1080. It only does 720p and I'm not sure that I would record it through this recorder. That being said, I don't use that very often. Uh, the 108060 is perfectly fine for a lot of the work that I do. Now one of the real benefits of the C200 is its ability to record 4K60 in raw light. And definitely if you're doing that, the image quality is much better than this setup. But that being said, this comes very close. Obviously can't do the 4K60, but for a lot of what I do, I'm still getting a lot of clients um, and other production houses asking me to film interviews in 4K and B-roll in 1080. So this setup definitely fills that gap. And there's definitely a lot of projects where uh, I'll probably just stop renting the C200. I don't think it's a necessary thing for me at this moment. Uh, there's gonna be some announcements over the next year about new cinema cameras, so this kind of gives me patience to look at the bigger picture and see if that is something I want to do. Currently I am planning to shoot a documentary on this setup, so not just client work, but I am starting to look at doing creative work with it as well, um, and, and also other production work. I think, I think there's a lot that can be done with this camera. Now one thing that the C200 definitely has over this camera is that this camera has really harsh rolling shutter if you're not careful. The way the cameras read information off the sensors is different. I don't know the details on that, but you can definitely tell the difference between the C200 rolling shutter, which is, which doesn't exist, um, or if it does, I really haven't seen it. it. Seems fairly negligible. But this camera, you've got to be more careful. You've got to do more work to stabilize. Um, any kind of shake can really send it off. That being said, a lot of the footage of the daytime stuff in that previous video was shot all handheld and it looks great. But definitely if you're shooting with stabilizers like tripods, gimbals, that sort of thing, you will not notice it. But that being said, the 1080 footage on this camera uh, looks pretty great. There's no rolling shutter and uprising it still looks a lot better than uh, some other cameras. So that is still an option if for those rare circumstances where that's needed. So if this video has been helpful to you, give it a thumbs up. If you have any questions about my camera setup and you know what I did in the last two videos, uh, feel free to leave a comment and subscribe and follow along if you wanna see more of these videos. Come along on the journey. It's gonna be great. Journey. All right, goodbye.